Hello everyone and welcome to um, tonight's event, which is uh, a special um, talk by Matthew Healy, who we're going to be hearing more about in a second, and it's to celebrate the successful auction that um, our two charities, South Georgia Heritage Trust and the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, have been running since the 20th of August, and we've got a few more days left to go, so uh, here you can hear some um, fantastic um, news from our, us about our auction and also hear a bit more about the lots. And we're really looking forward to a talk from Matthew as well. Now, the reason that we are having these events is, as you'll know, our two charities operate in South Georgia and the Antarctic. And uh, over the last season or so, we've obviously been struggling due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we have not been able to open our museums and interact with people in the normal way that we would. So these events have been our opportunity to get face to face with you and uh, to tell you about the work that we're doing, which is continuing despite the pandemic and for you to support us through this time. Um, so the South Georgia Heritage Trust, uh, our museum is closed. 2020 when we had to get our team out in a bit of a hurry um, but uh, our museum work I shouldn't come back I'll, I'll just pick up so our partners in these events um, and uh, Camilla would you like to say something about UKHT over the last <laughs> yes sir Yes, thank you. We lost you for a moment there, Alison, but I think, uh, I think we got the gist. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, UKHT, very like South Georgia House Trust, of course, you know, unable to open our uh, museum at Port Lockroy and uh, run a normal season and carry out the vital conservation work we would normally do. Um, so it's been a, it has been a very challenging 18 months, I think, for all, all of us. But this, you know, we, I think we've successfully uh, found ways in which we can tell stories and, and share, you know, the great work that we do and, and meet many of you, which is what um, this is, this has been all about. And also to gain and build support, which is so vital to both of us. Um, yeah, so uh, Alison, do you want me to introduce the issues, Matthew? Well, yes, please, that'd be yep. super, thank you. Really, okay, well, it's, it's my huge pleasure uh, to introduce tonight uh, Matthew Haley, from, uh, who is head of books, uh, manuscripts and maps at, at Bonham's Auctioner House. Um, really, Matthew, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're delighted to have you. Um, Matthew is um, a specialist in books, manuscripts, historical photographs and maps, and he also has a, a very special interest in travel and space, of course. Um, so you may, of course, recognise him as one of the experts on the Antiques Roadshow, um, so a, a celebrity within our midst, which is wonderful to see. But prior to um, Matthew's role at Bonhams in London, um, he spent four years in New York and Los Angeles sale rooms uh, before returning to the UK in 2013. So, uh, you know, huge amount of experience, and I'm sure, Matthew, you've seen some incredible things pass under your nose in all those years. So you've been involved in many sales involving polar items um, and of course have researched many of the interesting objects and items relating to southern ocean exploration so it's in South Georgia and, and, and Antarctica. So I, I understand you promised to shed some light on some of those today. So I'm delighted you're here Matthew uh, tonight and joining us and I'm for one very much looking forward to some of your insights. So Matthew it's over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm absolutely uh, thrilled to be here. I think um, the work that the South, South, South Georgia Heritage Trust and, and Antarctic Heritage Trust do is fantastic. And um, there, are, there are lots of synergies. I have to say my time in uh, New York and Los Angeles was probably less adventurous than, um, than yours in one pole or another. But, uh, but I'm very glad to be here uh, through the power of Zoom. Um, so uh, I run the book and manuscript department of Bonhams, but we also uh, run travel and, and exploration auctions once or twice a year. Um, and these are auctions which actually include pictures, drawings, prints, books, photographs, manuscripts, maps and artefacts indeed. Um, and as it happens, our next sale is actually coming up in two weeks time. It's on the 14th of September. And there's always been a uh, huge interest in polar material, but it's somewhere uh, something that just seems to be growing. Uh, there seem to be more and more bidders and more and more collectors coming into this space. So pieces from artifacts, particularly from the, the golden age of Antarctic exploration, which is to say that kind of pre-First World War period, uh, started emerging at auction in the 1990s. 
And I think the, the exploits of Scott and Shackleton were no longer in the kind of living memory. Um, and later generations of the polar explorers, families sort of started selling some of the items, you know, you can't sort of divide it very easily. So they were releasing them into the auction world. So that started about 30 years ago. Um, and nowadays we're mostly selling things that have been owned by collectors. Um, although occasionally we're still sourcing material originally from, from descendants of the, the families uh, involved in, in polar exploration. And who are the buyers? Well, uh, several museums uh, bid in our auctions, um, both in the UK and uh, often New Zealand uh, and other parts of the world. Um, but many of our buyers are private collectors, quite naturally. Um, a lot of them in the UK, but also again, Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, Canada. Um, and what I think is quite interesting is that many of the collectors have actually been on cruises to Antarctica. Um, which uh, loops in rather neatly with one of the auction lots in the in the charity auction we're talking about this evening as well. So I was uh, asked whether I could talk about some of the stories behind some of the polar lots that we've previously sold at Bonhams. Um, and uh, at this point, I'm going to share a little slideshow uh, just so I can show you some of the things that we've sold, which you can hopefully now see. Um, now, I was asked to speak about Antarctic items, obviously, um, but this I just couldn't resist. It's actually an item from the Canadian Arctic, um, and, and, and it's irresistible. Why is it irresistible? Well, sometimes I wonder where my Oxford University degree got me when I'm presented with a kind of rusty, mouldy tin of potatoes put in front of me, which I have to value and catalogue. But this is not just any tin of potatoes. This one was on Sir George Nair's 1875 expedition. Um, the expedition actually very sadly had a major scurvy outbreak. Uh, it turns out that they had the wrong type of citrus fruit on board. They took uh, West Indian limes instead of Mediterranean lemons, which as we all know is the best source of um, the vitamins needed to avoid scurvy. But there was also a lack of fresh food on the expedition. They were eating far too much tins uh, food and not enough fresh food. Um, and that's what sadly led to the scurvy that uh, uh, decimated the expedition. Apparently, one sub lieutenant was so bored of tinned food that in the middle of a church service, he shot dead a seal. And uh, he was rather uh, severely reprimanded by Nez for his uh, disrespect um, for this. But uh, this tin, which was contained within a, a sort of glazed box, thankfully, um, given its condition, was recovered um, in the Canadian Arctic in 1948 by uh, a US Army mission. It was sent there supposedly to restock and, and check in on weather stations. Um, but actually, the belief is that it was uh, a, a kind of a Cold War mission to try and sort of exert some power and, and saber rattling. Um, over Arctic sovereignty, which is obviously something which is still a conversation being had today. Um, rusty and, and mouldy as it was, we sold this tin of potatoes for £750. Quite remarkable. Now, much more appetising is this menu for uh, a meal on board uh, the steam yacht Nimrod. Um, Shackleton's uh, 1907 to 1909 expedition. And uh, it was to celebrate the birthdays of two shipmates, Dunlop and Mitchell. Um, the ship was at sea, it was on its way to Christchurch. And um, it's obviously a fully handwritten menu. It came to us from the family of Henry Dunlop. He was the chief engineer on the Nimrod uh, and his birthday is being celebrated here. You can see that when they were actually on board, they had fairly elaborate um, meals, many, many, many courses. I think Dunlop would have been rather pleased to see that the soup of the day was creme Dunlopé. Uh, and I think Mitchell is actually uh, represented by Cunel Saint-Michel, whatever they are. Personally, I would have liked to have had the dessert, which was abricot au Shackleton. Um, but they ate fairly well. They had mutton, roast beef and ham. Um, it really does sound like quite an impressive dinner. Obviously, they were on their way south, so uh, they hadn't yet started to run through their rations, and they obviously cracked open the champagne as well for this. That one sold with us for £2,000. 
Now, Aurora Australis. This is the first book printed and published in Antarctica. I'll say that again, the first book printed in Antarctica. Uh, it's once again from Shackleton's Nimrod expedition. And uh, as you may know, Shackleton took part in the discovery expedition previously in 1901 to 1904 um, with Scott. And he had the idea that to keep his kind of team engaged and amused, uh, they should produce a magazine, which he called South Polar Times. The idea was that during the kind of dark and monotonous winter months, um, the expedition team would, would keep up their morale and uh, produce this magazine. And they typed up one copy of each issue of South Polar Times. It was brought back to England at the end of the expedition. And they had the magazine then printed up in a limited edition um, of about 250 copies. So that project from the Discovery Expedition that Shackleton had come up with turned out to be very successful. The crew were kept well engaged by it. So when he had his own Nimrod expedition in 1907, he thought, let's go one step further. So he brought with him uh, a printing press, ink, type and paper, and asked the team for short stories, poems, um, humorous little essays, uh, funny little memoirs and, um, and drawings. And the idea was to, once again, avoid what he called the spectre of polar ennui. The um, conditions for producing a book on Antarctica turns out aren't that great. The ink had to be heated by candles to actually stop it from freezing. And uh, the printing took place mostly when the other men were sleeping. Um, because with them tromping around the hut at Cape Royds, it was causing vibration that was meaning that the uh, ink and paper were not settling very well. The binding, you can see the binding in the sort of central image here, the bindings uh, were actually made from pieces of tea chest. The covers were made from these pieces of wood, uh, plywood basically, and uh, they used what they had to hand. Um, whether Shackleton had forgotten to bring something better to bind them in, I don't know. But um, what's particularly charming is that these are usually stenciled with something. So this one has um, 251 pound tins. Um, we've seen other ones with mentions of peas and uh, soup. Um, and so it kind of gives you a little window into not only what they were binding their books in, but what they were eating at the time as well. They produced about 80 copies. Um, and uh, 80 or 100 copies, there are about 80 known to survive today. This is one of them uh, that we sold some years ago, also from the Dunlop uh, collection. So it came from the engineer on the Nimrod. And uh, as you can imagine, bibliophiles go absolutely mad over this. It's not only uh, the first book printed in Antarctica, it, as a collectible historic uh, antiquarian book, it's very sought after. But it's also a, a relic. It's also something that was there, something that was touched by the explorers uh, and produced in their quiet moments. Um, so not surprisingly, this one sold for £70,000. Now, this will be familiar to the um, UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, uh, yet another treasure from the Nimrod expedition. The culmination of the Nimrod expedition was the southern journey. Uh, it was aiming to reach the South Pole. Shackleton set off with three comrades. Uh, they didn't get to the pole. They did get, however, within 100 miles of it, and they set a new record for the furthest south reached by any explorer. On the southern party was Eric Marshall. He was the surgeon, cartographer, and photographer on the expedition. When he returned, he gave this sledge and flag to his old school uh, in Somerset, which was called Monkton Coombe School. And many decades later, uh, the school felt that maybe they weren't such a good home for this anymore. Um, actually, I shouldn't talk out of school as it were, but the sledge was living in the uh, kind of air training corps hut um, and wasn't uh, being displayed in any particularly felicitous way. So they consigned them to Bonhams for sale. Now, with Antarctic memorabilia, provenance is absolutely key. And the flag, in this case, was easy. Uh, you can see it in the photo in the top left. Um, it's uh, flying kind of third down from the uh, top of the flagpole. 
And uh, what more could you want than photographic evidence of the lot that you're selling um, in Antarctica? That was easy. And in, in addition, uh, Marshall actually writes in his diaries that he put the flag around uh, at the back, his back underneath his uh, outer layers to keep his back warm um, in, the, in the cold of the uh, Antarctic, which is just a marvelous detail. Now the sledge, the sledge was more difficult. Shackleton ordered 18 sledges in this size for the expedition. He said it was the best for general work, for it was not so long as to be unwieldy, and at the same time was long enough to ride over Sastrugi and Hummocky ice. It's actually about 11 foot long. Uh, it's a Nansen pattern sledge uh, from Scandinavia, and it's designed to kind of flex and bend um, rather than being too rigid. If it were too rigid going over bumps, then it would just fling its contents off. So it kind of bends and almost like having a car suspension in it. So 18 sledges went to Antarctica. Four of them set off on the Southern March. They were pulled by ponies, but um, unfortunately ponies turned out not to be the right uh, animal to use in Antarctica. So one after another, they perished. Um, some of them were munching on gravel, uh, which made them sick. Um, others obviously died from the bad weather and uh, one fell down a crevasse. So the men ended up leaving two of the sledges uh, en route on the Southern March and taking two of them on themselves, pulling them uh, from ropes. Um, you can actually see in the picture of the sledge, there's these uh, ropes where you can tug the sledge along. So two sledges went on, on the final bit of the Southern March. Was ours one of them? Well, it's impossible to be certain. Um, I studied the diaries. I even printed out copies of maps of um, the South Pole, tried to plot their journey and try and mark uh, at which point they deposited certain sledges to try and work out which one went where and when. But we just couldn't be sure. What we did know was that this was a sledge brought back by Eric Marshall, who was on the Southern journey and uh, he obviously thought it was significant enough to, to repatriate to the UK um, with the flag which he'd worn around his back. In any case, in our auction, there was furious bidding, many collectors involved and institutions as well. And the sledge and flag went to the same overseas collector. The arts minister at this point stepped in and blocked the export, uh, taking the view that these were British cultural heritage. And the National Maritime Museum and the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge had the opportunity to raise funds to buy these, uh, which they successfully did, um, and they were saved for the nation. And in fact, I think it was only probably in May or June that we actually uh, transferred them um, over to the museum's care. So it was a, a great uh, uh, outcome all round, and um, they'll be, I'm sure, soon viewable in the museums, which is fantastic. A slightly sadder story now, uh, moving on to Scott of the Antarctic and the first of Scott's farewell letters. In January 1912, he set off with Wilson, Bowers, Oates and Edgar Evans, uh, again trying to reach the South Pole and racing to reach it, in fact, before Roald Amundsen could make it there. As we know, Amundsen got there first and left a letter for Scott, uh, which he found when he finally reached it. Dejected, Scott and his men then began the return journey. Uh, Evans, unfortunately, dies after falling from a glacier and the weather gets steadily worse. Captain Oates is suffering from terrible frostbite and walks out into the blizzard with the famous words, I may be some time. Scott realizes that the writing is on the wall for all of them and starts penning farewell letters in his notebook. Uh, and he starts with this one, written on the 16th of March, 1912. He's writing to Edward Speyer, who is the treasurer of the expedition. Um, and he says, I hope this may reach you. I fear we must go and that it leaves the expedition in a bad muddle. But we have been to the pole and we shall die like gentlemen. I regret only for the women we leave behind. If this diary is found, it will show how we stuck by dying companions and fought this thing out well to the end. I think this will show that the spirit of pluck and the power to endure has not passed out of the race. 
This letter and a handful of other farewell letters were found on Scott's body in the tent where he died by a search party six months later. It's an absolutely extraordinarily powerful document. Um, it's a letter that Scott couldn't know, couldn't be sure whether it would be delivered or not. Um, he just wrote it in the hope that his message would get through, uh, which it did. Um, this is believed to be the last Scott farewell letter in private hands. Um, and it almost seems churlish to talk about the price it made at auction, but uh, it did sell for over £160,000. Um, and that was some 10 years ago with us. To end on a slightly happier note, uh, there's this beautiful photograph taken by the Australian photographer Frank Hurley uh, around 1911 to 1914. Hurley was on Douglas Mawson's uh, Australi Australasian Antarctic expedition and went on to become a war photographer. The, uh, the other great polar photographer whom you may have heard of is Herbert Ponting, who was on Scott's Terra Nova expedition uh, that I was just talking about. Now, Ponting sold his photographs at the time through an exhibition at the Fine Arts Society in London. And we tend to have two or three of them in every one of our travel sales. Um, it's particularly nice because sometimes they're in their original 100-year-old oak frames with little captions on, and often they have the exhibition label on the back. But Hurley's are much, much rarer. Uh, this one came to us actually as a small group um, having come originally from Douglas Mawson's own collection. And I just think it's an incredible photograph. Um, it shows what is described as a, a cavern eaten out by the waves under the coastal ice cliffs in Adelie land. And it's got this blue tone to it, uh, which uh, both Hurley and Ponting used, um, and is particularly sought, uh, sought after in their photographs. The photographs by them just keep on increasing in value. Um, some of the largest of them are, are, are quite large. I mean, they're sort of 70 by 50 centimeters and, um, and, and they're perennially popular. This one um, is, is the record that we've had for Hurley, which is 24,000 pounds nearly. So this, uh, this really only scratches the surface of the sort of items that, that we sell in Bonham's travel and exploration auctions, but um, hopefully it's been of some interest to you. Um, our next sale is on the 14th of September, as I mentioned, but sooner than that, you need to focus your minds on the wonderful charity auction being run by the Antarctic Heritage Trust and South Georgia Trust. Um, and uh, I, I commend you to look at some of the lots there. Great value. And it's a very important cause. So uh, do place bids within the next sort of uh, 36 hours if you can. Uh, it's, it's a great thing to support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Wow, that was amazing. And the power of, of those objects and the stories that they have to tell, you know, really incredible. And I know there's going to be a lot of questions for you. Uh, so can we just invite people to um, put questions in chat uh, for Matthew? Mm -hmm. Ah, I, I should say that somebody has pointed out indeed that the Shackleton menu is reusing stationery from the steam yacht morning, um, which is true. That was one of the relief uh, ships on the expedition. Um, so endlessly uh, um, inventive uh, Shackleton in, in reusing material. Fantastic. Actually, Matthew, I've got a question, a burning question, which I'll, so I'll go first and then maybe we can, everyone can gather the thoughts on other ones. Do you have, and this is probably really obvious, do you have special conservators in Bonhams that look after these items? We, we tend not to do much conservation work ourselves. Um, it's a great question. We, um, I know a lot of people um, use one particular conservator outside Cambridge. Um, who uh, is used by a lot of our clients, both buyers and sellers, and um, will generally point people in that direction. Um, we often recommend actually to sellers that they don't have any work done um, on pieces when they're consigning to auction, because each buyer will have their own feeling about what they want done. 
And I know from a book point of view, um, I prefer the book to be preserved as much as possible. Um, and I'd rather it be slightly defective, but more original. Whereas another buyer may want it to be completely sort of usable and you can put it on a bookshelf and not have to worry about it. So we tend to advise leaving it to, um, leaving it to buyers. Great, thank you. Uh, Lisa, I think you're going to help out with the, the chat. Would you yeah. like to? Yep. Um, a question from Karen. What is your personal favourite item that has come up for auction and why? <laughs> oh, the problem is it seems to change every single auction. Um, sometimes, actually, it's the things which we've personally had to kind of fight hardest for. Um, so I was chasing an album of Frank Hurley photographs, um, which he produced. He produced a number of kind of presentation albums um, when, uh, when he came back from um, Douglas Mawson's expedition. Uh, and one of these was um, delivered to uh, the royal family. Um, and I was chasing this album for, for some years from an owner who couldn't quite let it out of their hands. And we eventually got it in um, earlier this year or the end of last year. Um, and I think that one made about £70,000. So it's usually the thing that's been the, the, the hardest to get, which is the thing I enjoy the most. <laughs> OK, one from Ben. And thank you, Matthew. We mentioned, you mentioned provenance. Are there many fake Antarctic historical items put up for auction? Um, we don't get offered that many. Um, but... That said, you know, we're very scrupulous about uh, history and provenance. So, you know, for something to have um, Shackleton's name written on it or, or scratched into it isn't really enough. Um, we need to know where it's come from. And um, it's fortunately, it, it's recent enough that it should be possible to, to work out what the trajectory has been of things that come through to auction. So, you know, if it's a sledge that's a Nansen pattern sledge, um, it's the right length. It doesn't. It, we can't necessarily say it was on a particular expedition unless we have any any real uh, documentary proof and, and recording of when it was donated. So um, I wouldn't say that there are fakes being offered, but um, you know, there's certainly more value attached the better documentation you have. Okay. Um, where are we going? Where are we going? Um, Gosh, they're flying in the questions now. Sarah, are there any items that you would like to see come up for auction relating to Antarctica and the Golden Age? Mm. That's a very good question. Goodness, <laughs> I mean, if I could go to the Scott Polar Research Institute and raid them, uh, that, would be, that would be a field day for me. Um, I must say, I was astonished when I went there, back to the subject of the farewell letter, that they have drawers of them. They have a kind of... Uh, um, a cabinet with, I don't know, six or seven or eight or nine of them. And I was just pulling out these drawers one by one thinking, wow, wow, wow. Um, but obviously, you know, with, with my curatorial hat on, it's better that these things stay together and, and people can compare them. <laughs> Ooh, one of our trustees, Jane. What's the earliest Southern Ocean Antarctic related item that's come to Bonhams? Should my camera hmm. that's also a very good question <laughs> i would think that probably it's things from the the discovery expedition um but uh but there's nothing that immediately springs to mind um i mean obviously you know polar exploration and polar collecting divides itself into two basically and you have kind of north polar material which is 19th century and south polar which is early 20th century um and it's a fairly clear delineation really um so um so i don't think we get much earlier than uh, than discovery i would also say that actually the vast majority of the material we sell is is from um english british uh uh expeditions um, obviously there is a huge amount of material from um, Norway um, and from other parts of the world but but the market tends to focus on um, the British explorers really. Mm -hmm. um, Barry has noted you know how moving the stories are behind the artifacts that you've talked about but I also asked what is the most valuable 
expensive item sold? I think for us, it probably is that uh, that Scott letter. I mm. think that's our, our um, high point in terms of polar material. Um, and it's difficult to see what could do much better. Um, I mean, we sold that one in 2012. We had um, a centenary auction to commemorate um, the kind of tragic ending of the um, Terra Nova expedition and also the, the success of Amundsen reaching the South Pole. Um, so when you think, you know, that's nine years ago now, uh, amazingly. Um, I think if that letter were to come up again, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it made over 200, maybe 250,000. So mm. um, I think the, the owner of that was, was, was right to spend the money at the time, even though it seems like an awful lot of money, but the market's uh, gone up even since then. Mm. Um, Margaret's asked, who holds the sled now? Is it Scott Polar or the Maritime Museum? Uh, it's actually, it's an interesting arrangement. Um, so they were, we sold them as separate lots. We sold the sledge and the flag as separate lots. They were bought by the same buyer. Um, and therefore they were, they were blocked by uh, the arts minister. And um, they had to be kind of bought on block together. So um, the uh, National Maritime Museum in Greenwich collaborated with the Scott Polar Research Institute to do a joint bid. Um, and so sort of technically they both own both uh, I think but the setup is that the sledge has gone to the National Maritime Museum and the flag has gone to the Scott Polar Research Institute um, and I do believe that they uh, they ought to be viewable um, fairly easily or fairly soon at least. That will make Margaret's day because she lives nearer to the uh, Maritime Museum. <laughs> um, Bob's asked are Norwegian expedition articles of interest? Well, um, yes and no. Um, they're of some interest, but um, I think I think there's a bit of a language barrier, to be frank. And I think also that you know the American market um, they have their own explorer in Admiral Byrd, um, but they kind of find themselves drawn more to Scott and Shackleton, um, and. For whatever reason, unfortunately, poor Amundsen, uh, despite the fact that he's the guy that made it there, um, doesn't get so much of a look in. So books and manuscripts to an extent, but artefacts, we've never really run across many. Mm -hmm. um, and it may, may also be an element of supply. I'm not sure whether they're already kind of snapped up by um, Scandinavian institutions and, and there actually isn't that much out in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, Teresa? <laughs> it's an interesting one. What is your view on the ownership of the Shackleton whiskey that was found in Antarctica? Should it be more widely distributed so that we can all enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like whiskey as much as the next person, but um, I'm probably treading on slightly thin ice <laughs> and, and beyond my area of expertise here. Um, it's a very good question. I mean, you know, my view of the material that we sell is that, you know, it was brought back uh, by one of the explorers and, and retained for whatever reason. So we've sold mittens, we've sold um, uh, kind of sort of knives um, that have been used by them um, and, you know, tins of potatoes and everything else. And in a sense, I think my view would probably be if they've been brought back to the mainland, back to the UK, uh, or even New Zealand, then they're kind of fair game. And, and if they haven't, then they're not. Um, but I don't know if there's a, there's a black and white rule there, really. Okay. Oh, Pat and Sarah, um, South Georgia. It is, um, they've asked, going back a bit further, for South Georgia, have you handled anything from Cook in the 1770s? Cook books, yes. Um, obviously, the accounts of Cook's voyages, which were published back in, in uh, London, um, there are some um, artefacts collected by Cook from his um, voyages, which um, move around the um, sort of uh, Pacific um, uh, collectibles uh, field, sort of um, tribal artefacts and that kind of thing. Um, personally, that would be my kind of holy grail. I would dearly love something that was picked up on Tahiti by Captain Cook. Um, but, um, but we haven't, <laughs> unfortunately, had them come through our hands yet. Okay. Um, gosh, the questions are still flying in. 
I think you covered off about research. Do you only do research in-house or you, Scott Polar, Bass, anyone else? Oh, well, we definitely, definitely tap into the knowledge of Scott Polar. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I bug them on frequent occasions. Um, we do most of our research in-house and, and obviously we have a reference library and, and resources, but um, there's there's absolutely no um, no parallel really for the, the knowledge of um, Alex and Nermi and, and the other staff at Scott Polar um, who are just fantastic and, and we couldn't really do our jobs without them. Okay, I'm just copying one. Uh, Karen, can you buy Shackleton whiskey that has been produced to the exact recipe of the original? I don't know, Camilla, you not <laughs> I think yes. the answer is yes, isn't yes. it? And, yes. and the answer is, uh, is it not, Camilla, that you can do so in your auction? <laughs> Indeed so, <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yes, yeah, certainly there was, um, the original distillers did um, uh, sort of reverse engineer the recipe for the Shackleton whiskey that was found under the hut and, uh, and did um, come up with a with the recipe and created some special editions, um, limited runs of, of um, Shackleton's whiskey. And yes, yeah, so and now there's a, a, a more commercial version. Um, and as you say, there is one in our auction. So if you're looking for <laughs> whiskey, then I would thoroughly recommend um, having a look at that. <laughs> um. Okay, did the Scott letter go to a private buyer? Is the best place for it not one of the museums? Uh, yes and <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yes, it did go to a private buyer within the UK. Um, I know the buyer quite well, um, and it, to my mind, they're a very safe pair of hands. Um, obviously, if somebody is shelling out £160,000 for something, mm. uh, they're going to look after it, typically. Um, I don't think that they have long-term plans for it. Um, uh, you know, it may one day re-emerge, um, or it may one day find its way into an institution um, that way. So, um, you know, yes, it would be nice for it to be on display in a museum, but, you know, Scott Polar do have several of them that you can go and look at um, very easily in a, in a kind of secure glazed cabinet. Um, mm. And uh, and it's, it's in a good home at the moment. That's good. Um, there's been quite a few things popping up about the uh, whiskey. Um, Sandra says she inherited six bottles from her brother in 2019, and I think that might have been from the limited run that they did a limited number of bottles that Swite and McKay produced. Um, but let's go back to some questions. Um, actually, this is quite an interesting one. How common is it for institutions to intervene so that artifacts can stay in public hands rather than being sold to private collectors? Well, um, uh, it's relatively common. Uh, I mean, there are UK institutions that um, bid in our auctions, um, which is obviously one way of trying to uh, ensure that they stay in, in public hands. Um, it kind of this kind of links in with a, a, another question I spotted, which was uh, sort of all links in with um, the, the export blocks. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, there is a there is a very good uh, system that operates where we have to apply for an export license for buyers who wish to export things. Um, over a certain price threshold usually. And um, institutions do basically have the opportunity to um, kind of place dibs on something and and are given time often to to fundraise. I say often. Uh, It happens um, to us probably once every couple of years. Um, But it's a a system that works quite well. Somebody asked whether the the actual private buyer overseas was kind of remunerated or, or compensated in any way. Hmm. Um, all, all they do is end up not out of pocket. They don't kind of get any compensation. And actually very often um, we, we're, you know, the, their money is, is out of their hands for, can be as long as a year. So um, it's not ideal for the overseas buyers, but I think my feeling is that the system is fair all around. Um, it's fair to the seller who should, you know, deserves a market price. In this case, the, the seller was a school and you know, has a charitable aim in itself. Um, but it's also fair to the private buyers, and I think it's fair to the institutions who have the opportunity to, to match the market price. Um, there's a couple more. RJ, of all the Antarctic items that you've seen, whether for sale or just viewing, which are your favourites? I think for me, it has to be the sledge. 
Um, I, I loved the sledge uh, dearly. And um, I've, I've seen one or two other sledges um, from, uh, from Scotland Shackleton Expeditions as well, which I just think are, are marvellous. Um, there's something quite sort of visceral about it. You know, it, it's big, it's bulky, it's heavy. Um, and, and, you know, the fact that you can see these in the pictures, you can see them loaded up with furs and provisions and, and, and equipment and um, rock samples. Um, uh, I, just, I just think they're, they're one of the coolest things. <laughs> okay. Um, Sarah, is there a record kept of where special treasures, especially in private hands, are so that they don't get accidentally sent to a, a charity shop when someone has a clear out? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ruin your show. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, alas, no, really. Um, I mean, the only record that exists is when uh, you can have, if, if you're sort of sitting on something that would have a particularly big inheritance tax bill, mm. uh, you can opt for it to be uh, kind of excluded from the estate and, and it's put on a kind of uh, arts council list. Um, that makes it kind of conditionally exempt, which means you have to allow people to access it and see it. Um, but that's the only such list, really. And, and that obviously requires, you know, the estate to recognise what's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to say one of the only things that really potentially stops things going to charity shops is communicating with potential heirs. So if you are sitting on treasures, um, I would implore you to speak to <laughs> children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, godchildren, whatever you need to, solicitors, and say, by the way, I've got these special things. Um, and, uh, and, you know, please make sure they're looked after. Mm -hmm. I would, however, say that going to a charity shop does not mean all is lost, um, because we actually sell quite a lot of items for Oxfam, and uh, they will ring us uh -huh. up if they have a book that they think is valuable or important. Um, and we've sold many things for them over the years. So um, even in a charity shop, all hope is not lost. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> um, who have we got? Leslie. Um, are there any lots that you've dealt with that have caused a particularly emotional response with yourself? Well, I always get excited when I see uh, Terra Nova items um, mm -hmm. because my, apart from the, the sort of tragedy of, of the Scott story, uh, my great, 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 great uncle, um, Harry Pennell, was actually the commander of the Terra Nova. Um, and so when wow. Scott was, uh, was landed on, on Antarctica, um, Harry Pennell was actually in charge of the ship and um, making uh, journeys for provisions and that kind of thing. So uh, every time, any time I see anything particularly photographic that's uh, Terra Nova related, I'm always on the lookout for, for great, great uncle Harry. Um, and I've yet to find, sadly, a, a really good photo of him um, that, I could, that I could get my hands on. Um, mm. But I'm saving up the pennies for when that happens. <laughs> I've got uh, a couple more. Uh, one question and then some for your info. David, are you at all proactive in seeing items or do you simply rely on items being offered for sale? It's a sort of a chicken and egg situation. Mm. Um, you know, we don't know what's out there until we know what's out there um mm. and so you know you kind of need somebody to to raise their head above the parapet and say you know hey i've got this marvelous thing um and uh and when they do you know we're very happy to have a kind of no strings attached conversation because i just i find the material so fascinating so i'm always thrilled to to talk to people about what they have and, and to give them some sort of background um from an auction point of view um, but effectively, until something's offered to us for sale, you know, there's there's not a whole lot we can do. We know what we've sold to people, um, and we know some collectors and dealers in the space. Um, but if we don't know what's out there, we don't know what's out there. Mm. Right, I have a, a last thing from Simon who says, for our info, the Royal Museum's Greenwich is planning to display the sled later this year after a special support has been designed and built. So you'll be able to go and see it. <laughs> <laughs> Hurrah. <laughs> and that is the questions. Fantastic. Fantastic. 
Matthew, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely riveting. And it was wonderful to see, um, you know, some of those artifacts and some of the stories behind them. I think, you know, these they just come to life, don't they? And they're so, some of these things are so modest, like the tin of potatoes, and yet, you know, they just spark just the, the adventure and the, and the peril and the, and the and the endurance and all of that. So, it's, yeah, I think, it, you know, these you have a fascinating career as these things pass through your hands, for sure. Um, everyone, thank you very much for your questions. Um, that was tremendous. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, just um, focus a little for a few minutes on our auction um, and just pick pick on a few lots and tell you a little bit about them. So I'm going to just ask uh, Alison just to uh, pick up the first one there. I think uh, CJ is going to share some images for us. Thank you very much. Alison, over to you. Thanks, Camilla. So this is our uh, star lot in the auction, which is a, a cruise for two people, which has been really generously donated from cruise company Albatross Expeditions. And if you go on this cruise, uh, you'll be heading off towards the end of the year. But the dates can uh, be revised if, you know, the usual kind of thing happens and, and there's uh, any sort of problem with them. Um, so it's a trip for two to South, um, to the South Sandwich Islands and to Antarctica. Um, so you've still got opportunities. There have been a lot of bids on this item, um, but yeah, you can go on your very own uh, journey and maybe even make your own newsletter up if you so desire. Uh, so yeah, so that one's still up for grabs. Uh, over to you, Camilla, for the next one. Thank you very much. This is um, possibly uh, a real a real piece of uh, modern heritage, maybe. So it's one of the, I think, one of the most recognisable features in any picture you see of the historic sites uh, in Antarctica, apart from the penguins, of course, and the wildlife, uh, is the Union flag, that, which flies whenever teams are on site. And this is a tradition that's gone back, you know, right back to the 1940s, if not before. So when, when there's a, a, a team in residence at a base, then the Union flag will fly. And it's, a, it's, a, it's been a tradition um, for you know for decades and decades and we continue that here at the UK AHT when we send teams down to our bases so Port Lockroy we raise the union flag each season when we when the team arrives and it, it is lowered as the last job when the team's departing and um, also when we send a conservation team down to other sites that uh, we don't open in the same way as Port Lockroy and um, they too when, when they're in residence will raise the flag upon arrival um, and and lower it at, um, when they're leaving this flag uh, was flown at our most southernmost historic site, Base E on Stonington Island. And it's, this is a base, if, um, if you're not familiar, uh, with has a, a long history that goes back to the 1940s. And is known, I think, best for the kind of epic dog sledging journeys that were carried out from there. Um, the early flights that were that were heading down that to that part of um, Antarctica and Marguerite Bay and landing on the um, on an ice tongue, um, and of course uh, in the U.S. base, but East Base next door on the same island, a few hundred yards away, the very first women uh, wintered um, on Stonington Island. So it's got a really fascinating history as a base. In 2018, we sent a team down to uh, carry out some um, survey work and some vital uh, emergency repairs. And they, they flew this flag uh, whilst they were there for three months. Um, and when they brought it down uh, on their way home, they all signed it. Um, and so we have what is really a one-off. So you can be sure it is a kind of a genuine piece of Antarctic history in the making, which is following a long tradition of flag flying in Antarctica. Alison, back to you. Thank you. And the next uh, one we'd like to highlight tonight is um, a work of art by artist Michael Vesoki, and it's called Linescape One. Now, Michael um, was the winner of a commission to actually create an artwork on the island of South Georgia uh, to reinterpret the Flensing Plan. So you're going to be hearing a lot more about him. Um, his work explores the world of science, the character of geology and the sense of human impact on habitat. This particular piece extends Michael's fascination with human preoccupation with measuring and surveying land and excavating and altering landscapes. Michael has gathered a significant reputation for public and private sculpture. And his notable commissions include a memorial to the bicentenary of the abolition of transatlantic slave trade in the city of London. And he was also the recipient of the prestigious Gerwood's Sculpture Prize in 2009, so maybe an investment opportunity here as well, and a very special piece. Over to you, Camilla. Thank you very much. So this is Lot 13, which is a sculpture um, called Geography 236 by Doug Cocker, RSA. 
Doug. Doug is a, one of Scotland's finest sculptors, actually, and his work features in both private and public collections across the UK. So a really significant artist. His work um, often focuses on nature and its, its kind of strength and its power. And he works in very natural materials like wood and, and other materials like that. And he's, he's very inspired by landscapes, um, both local to him in, in Scotland, but and also remote landscapes, uh, especially, and especially the kind of movement and um, uh, with, movement within them seasons and weather patterns and uh, alter the landscape and he tries uh, and he uses that as inspiration um, to create these these really um, fascinating um, works works of art we have a couple of sculptures by him in, in the in the auction but i think this one I, I really like this one it's a kind of a unique kind of um, very highly textured uh, landscape very sculptural um, and it's a very striking example of, of the work that he does and he, he always sources his materials very locally to where he lives in in Perthshire in scotland Alison, over to you. Thanks. So the next lot um, is an Art Deco penguin brooch for all you penguin lovers. And let's face it, we're all penguin lovers. Um, it's an attractive and unusual vintage brooch. It would make a lovely gift for someone uh, who loves penguins and would look dazzling on a jacket. Uh, quality blue, black and red enamel work is used to great effect amidst the diamond cut stones. Uh, so yeah, grab it while you can. Camilla. Thank you. And now for something completely different. So uh, how many about you are budding rock stars? Uh, I'm sure a few of you are. Recording artist, record producer and sound engineer uh, and also UKHE trustee, uh, Bob Kidby has very generously offered a day in his recording studio in Suffolk. So this is your chance to cut your own record in a professional, I think, 40 track recording studio in Suffolk countryside. Um, so very accessible to a lot of places. Um, you'll have access to instruments in the studio um, and all the technical expertise you'd need uh, to create a, a record. Or you can bring your own instruments and backing tracks um, and, of course, your song. Um, and to lay down your own tracks and have them professionally produced. So extremely high quality experience this. At the end of the day, you'll have a CD and a digital copy of your recording to take home and, and release publicly and to hit the charts, of course, and kickstart that overdue career as, a, as the next big thing in music. So I would say, what are you waiting for? Alison, back to you. Thanks. And the last uh, lot we'd like to highlight to give you an opportunity to get your own special part of South Georgia or Antarctica is this island tree sculpture by Alan Watson. Alan's a Scottish artist who was on the final selection panel for the Special Commission for South Georgia's new sculpture by Michael Fasoki, which I was telling you about. Um, predominantly working with wood, Alan's sculptures exploit the tension between two and three dimensions, playing with flat surfaces, edges, lines, shape and form. He's very kindly donated this wonderful piece, Island Tree, to the auction, with all proceeds helping to support our charities. So get going. Uh, you can find the link to our auction on the chat function. Um, and uh, can I just remind you again of the Bonhams Travel Sale on 14th of September also. Thank you. Camilla, some last words from yourself? Yes, absolutely. I'll just, I'll just notice in the chat, Sarah said she can definitely recommend taking a closer look at Hannah Lawson's artwork, number lot number 15. We met her on our South Georgia and Antarctica voyage and she's incredibly talented and we bought two much smaller pieces. So I can think of no better advice. So it's really it's down to me to say thank you to everybody who's taking part tonight. I hope this has whetted your appetite for these and all the other wonderful items in our, in our auction. Um, Time is getting on. Uh, you have a couple of days left before the auction closes uh, later this week. So I would say don't hold back. Um, this is very much for two uh, fantastic causes for uh, South Georgia Heritage Trust and UKHT. Yep, bidding. Right. I'd like to thank you, Matthew, for your wonderful talk tonight uh, and for sharing those great stories for the very special polar artifacts. I think, um, yeah, they're very moving. I think many of those, I think we're going to remember those for a long time. I would remind you, as uh, Dalson has too, uh, about the upcoming travel sale at Bonham. So check that out. That's going to be absolutely fascinating later this month. But as Matthew says, only after you've exhausted all options with the auction we have in front of us today. Thank you to the teams who have made this event and the auction a reality and uh, all the, team, the teams at South Georgia and UK um, Antarctic Heritage Trust. Um, you know, we can't, it's very much a team effort. You see some of them on the screen here today, but there's more in the background all working hard to make this, make this all work. And finally, thank you to all of you who have taken part and joined us tonight um, and to show us your support. Without you, we couldn't do all this important work that we do in, this remarkable, in these remarkable places 
at the bottom of the world. So thank you. Uh, and I'll say good night and keep bidding.